Hi, I'm Jade. I'm Chief of Staff at Ninja Theory, and I'm one of the women who came together to set up the Women of Xbox UK group. And we're excited to share with you more of what our series will involve. Women of Xbox matters to me because I want more people identifying as women to see how awesome this industry is. Hi, I'm Rebecca Simpson. I'm a Senior Operations Manager at Playground Games. And Women of Xbox matters to me because it's a platform for reaching the next generation of female game developers. So I'm Veronica, or V as everyone likes to call me in the industry, and I'm Talent Ambassador at Rare in the UK. Women of Xbox means to me that it is completely possible to work at an amazing company like Xbox, and that if you can see it, you can be it. I'm Zoe Harrop, I work as Senior Business Coordinator for Xbox Game Studios Quality UK. Um, Women of Xbox UK matters to me. Really, I just want to encourage um, everybody from all walks of life to consider a career in gaming. Hi, I'm Melissa Knox, senior producer at Rare, making Everwild. Women of Xbox UK matters to me because it's a place where we can come together to assist each other with our challenges, both as game developers and as women, and where we can celebrate each other's successes. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm a recruitment ninja at Ninja Theory. Women of Xbox UK matters to me because it's an amazing opportunity to build a diverse network of inspiring women. Hi, I'm Louise and I'm executive producer at Rare on the wonderful project Everwild. Um, the women of Xbox UK matters to me because I want everyone everywhere to recognise that diverse teams make wonderful, inspiring, creative, interesting, different, unique games and it's far more representative of our audience. And so, without further ado, we'd like to roll the first of hopefully many videos from the women of Xbox UK. This one is for you students. It's all about how to get into the games industry. Enjoy. Welcome to the first ever conversations with women of Xbox UK. Today's topic is that old chestnut, how to get into games. This is a familiar subject. You've probably attended talks on this before. I doubt this is the first time you've heard about it. But uh, if it is, it's important that we keep revisiting it because the best practices and the advice around how to get into the industry actually evolves as the industry changes and matures. So we've got with us here today uh, women from across the Xbox Studios UK. Thank you for being here. We're going to start off uh, with a bit of intro from each person. So if you could tell us your name, your position, the studio that you work in, and which project you're working on, if you can. And then a very brief history of your career. And specifically, if you could chat about how you got into the games industry. So Ellie, would you care to kick us off? Hey, uh, I'm Ellie. I work at Ninja Theory. I'm a senior engine programmer specializing in graphics. I've been with Ninja Theory for seven years, and I am currently working on Hellblade 2 Senua Saga and also the Mara project. Amazing. Thank you. Rebecca. Um, my name is Rebecca Haig. Um, I'm a scriptwriter at Playground Games, and we're currently working on the Fable game. That was just announced. Ah. Um, <laughs> I've been working in games for about uh, four years and started indie. Um, and I've I've just passed my playground anniversary um, this August, which is very exciting. Congrats! Thank you. Up next, we've got Alice. This is going to be almost identical, but uh, I'm Alice. <laughs> uh, I'm a game designer at Playground Games, currently working on Fable as well. Um, yeah, I also started indie and I've been in the industry for just over four years as well. So uh, yeah, it was very similar to Rebecca's, but that's me. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Camilla. Hi, I'm Camilla. Um, I'm working at Ninja Theory. I'm a rigger and it's been two years I started that. That's my first job in the game uh, or animation industry. Previously, I was working marketing and then I did a one year master in 3D animation and then that's that's my first job after I finished. Awesome. Thanks, Camilla. And last but not least, Chloe. Hi, uh, I'm Chloe. Uh, I work for Rare and I'm on the Everwild and Sea of Thieves. I'm a music contractor and I actually started off in Rare a year ago as an intern. So quite new to the business. Excellent. Thanks. 
Uh, and my name is Melissa. I am the senior producer on Everwild at Rare. Uh, I fell into games completely by accident. Uh, I did my master's degree in PR and marketing and uh, discovered very quickly it wasn't for me. And I sort of got a, a part-time office admin position at a game studio. And as soon as I went in, I knew it was the place for me. People were in jeans and there was Nerf guns everywhere. Um, that was an indie eight or nine years ago. And I've been in games ever since. So we're going to hop on to the questions now. And uh, the first question we have is from Maddie. And Maddie asks, how common is it to get jobs based on applications alone? Is it more likely to get a job from connections or friends? Rebecca. In my personal experience um, and from the experience of people that I know, um, it's kind of both. Um, and I would very strongly say it's both. I'd never want to lean into one or the other. Um, applications are that thing that is put in the room when you're not there. So they are equally as important as your first impression. Um, I think there's this there's this real push in our industry to like it's the it's the big word it's the networking word, and everyone is obsessed with like you've got to shell out this money to go to these places to go to Brighton to go to um, I was going to say CEX that's not where I mean <laughs> EGX yeah, EGX not a form of letters. <laughs> an assortment of letters. You must go to an assortment of letters in order to do the networking thing that everyone wants you to do. And that's meeting people, that's meeting developers like yourself, that's meeting developers in jobs, um, gathering business cards, like, you know, they're collectible and they'll sit in the bottom of your bag for years and you'll put them in a drawer. When it's kind of, it's kind of about both it's about your online presence as well it's about how much like you interact with the wider community not only just the people that you're emulating the jobs of but also the people that play the games the people like you that are also looking at those positions people who are creating portfolios that you should support just as much as you'd like the support for yourself and at the end of the day applications are just as important as you and your presence and your personal presence and how you how you deliver yourself um, because that is the little piece of paper or the little digital screen that you've made look all pretty and poured all over that is going to get you the job it's going to be the last thing it's the last thing that they're probably going to see before they decide whether or not to get you into a room mm -hmm. i think um i agree completely with, with rebecca i think that both are super important um and for me a weird kind of like mixture of both of those things like applications and connections is um my linkedin profile which is kind of like a resume but also like a networking thing um since for me personally uh, a recruiter from pg reached out to me on linkedin so they had that kind of digital yeah. me mm -hmm. um but it was on like a networking platform so i think uh, there that's kind of both doing it's doing their work um and i i think that linkedin's a really a really handy tool for that. Um, I think that you should definitely do both of the other things, but as like a kind of thing that sits in the middle, I think LinkedIn's super, super useful for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think especially at the start of your career as well, um, because you're still working on forming those connections and building that network, it is really important that you're doing as much of that as possible, but your your application is really strong. So I think as you move through your career, it's, it shifts a bit and it becomes much easier to use that network because you spent the time building it and people trust you and they've worked with you and they can uh, confidently recommend you to someone else. So uh, I think by the time you get to even five years, I'd say if you've had a couple of jobs in the industry, it starts to get a lot easier to call people up and go, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking around. I was wondering if you knew of anyone that had anything. Uh, and vice versa, as you say, Alice, people will start getting in touch with you and going, hey, I heard you were really good at what you do. What would you think about coming here for a job? So uh, did anyone get a job specifically from a connection, like without even having to make an application? A little bit, sort of. Um, but yeah, I also got the, um, the recruiter just like Alice, um, I think it was, was, did you get Nick from work? Uh, I got Rosie. Oh, you got Rosie. Um, <laughs> I got Nick. Um, and I was like, there's no bad. Way. I got Nick. Nick called me. I got Nick. <laughs> um, but I was like, there's no way, there's no way this is real. I was like, playground, I th hang on, those are the Forza guys. I was like, ooh, that's exciting. Um, and I was checking up on this guy because I was like, 
that is one thing to do. Like if a recruiter does contact you, check the recruiter um because linkedin you can get an assortment of people contact you via that online messaging and it's just important to do just as you would any other job do your background research on who is reaching out to you um and whether it's whether or not it's in your best interests and thankfully for us it was very much in our best interest and um i heard about the job because the gentleman that i'm now very fortunate to work for now um reached out to my uh, old senior writer on my last job um, because they previously worked with him and unfortunately he wasn't available for that position um, but they recommended me instead and I got that reach out which was really really amazing um, and again it's like it's as much as what you know as who you know sometimes um, so that was really really fortunate. Okay, our next question comes from Lucia, Lucia, apologies. Hopefully one of those pronunciations was correct. Uh, they ask, which would be more beneficial to my long-term career, a university degree or an apprenticeship or internship? Alice, what do you think? I think that they all have like massive value, um, but I actually have none of those <laughs> things. Um, related games anyway, I, I did my degrees in education studies. Um, I never really thought that games was something that I could even get into, if that makes sense. So at the time, I was like, okay, actually, I didn't even realize I could study games at the time. So I just, um, I kind of went for what I thought was a more achievable dream, which was like working in Japan, which sounds like crazy, but I thought that was more achievable than <laughs> working in games. Um, but yeah, I did that. And and. I was just so passionate about games that I just kind of started working on them in my own time. Um, so I think whatever you do, as make sure that you're like constantly working on your passion throughout like whatever routes that you have something practical to to show at the end of it. I think that's the most important thing, no matter what you you choose. But I'm sure like other people have experience in at least one of those routes, and you can like take it from <laughs> from that. Yeah. Oh. I 100% agree with you, Alice, on whatever you do, you just got to do to the best of your ability because it's not so much as a black and white, should I go for a uni or go for an apprenticeship or internship? There are options out there. Like the degree that I took, it was a three-year course, but on your third year, you actually go out for a year-long placement where you go find that um, internship, apprenticeship, whatever you want to do. Or you don't even necessarily need to go for an internship, just do something which would benefit you in the long mm -hmm. run so that's that's what I did even though my year long wasn't actually technically anything games related my internship was actually after I graduated so yeah overall there are options out there I would just like to add that like sometimes people think that just doing a course like going to university is just about learning the techniques but actually what you take out from that is much more of the connections you make the teachers that you meet and people that come to university from the studios that you can talk to. So all the network that you gain when you go to university, I think is very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. I think the soft skills that you pick up both in a um, uni degree or an apprenticeship or internship are really important to, to talk about as well, right? Because when people are coming, if you're, if you're lucky enough to get your application through and, and maybe you don't know anyone and you get to the interview stage, uh, you need to be personable, right? You need to be able to have a confident conversation about what you think you can add to wherever you're going. And, you know, likewise, they need to be confident that you can do teamwork and that you're going to be able to take criticism and feedback because these are all things that happen every day, no matter what your role is in games. And so I think uh, really any experience that shows that you have those soft skills, that you're going to be a good team member and that people will uh, enjoy working with you is is really important and shouldn't really be overlooked. It's definitely not just about like having the technical skills on paper. That's kind of only half the job. Um, if I can just add some on the back off the back of what you just said, um, I think it's just important that um, I used to work in in the university uh, doing their open days and such and that sort of thing and obviously we've heard about so many there are so many university courses now centered around games um they've honestly they've just exploded in like the last five years it's it's amazing um 
But that also means that you need to, if you are looking for the university route, and it is, I am sure we can all agree, a lot of money right now um, to be investing in that future, make sure you definitely are looking around and you're shopping around because you are now a consumer and you do have a lot of options. Um, and I would personally recommend having done the university route myself, um, look for a course that allows you to specialize if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, look for a course that where a large part, a uh, large portion of what you're going to do is in teams um, because you're not working on your own. You are never working on your own in a game, um, whether or not you're working in a tiny little studio with a, like a few people up to like some of the gig studios. Um, you will always be working with people, um, but also make sure that you do and are offered time to yourself. And you do have time to work on something that you can say is yours. So you can put it in your portfolio and say 100% of that is all mine. Mm -hmm. um, that I would say that's really important and definitely shop around. It's amazing how much the the industry, including education, has changed. I was something that you said there, Rebecca, triggered a memory of uh, my boss, Louise. And when she got into games 20 years ago, a friend of hers told her that she'd seen a sign tacked up at the community center that said they were looking for someone. And she just rocked up to Rare and said, like, hey, I'm an animator. Do you need some skills? And I mean, I'm sure it was much more involved than that. There were <laughs> stuff, but like the fact that we're, we've gone from games as a very young industry where it is just a piece of paper physically tacked up on a board somewhere to now we have the choice of what sort of education are you going to get? It's come so far and in, in so little time. Um, and probably important to note as well that there are specifically accredited universities to get into games. So do do your research before you, you go, because there will certainly be universities that are better suited for what you are after, what you're looking to do. And even if you don't know what you want to do, there will be universities that can offer you that broad spectrum of here's a bit of programming, here's a bit of audio, here's a bit of animation. What do you enjoy? And then you can go a bit deeper in there. Uh, Ellie, I was wondering if you had anything to add, given your engineering background. Yeah, I would say as a programmer, um, the degree is possibly a bit more important than with other disciplines, um, certainly to get the level of skill and knowledge that you would need for programming. It is not impossible on your own, but it's much more difficult. Mm. That said, um, kind of related to what Rebecca said, there's a lot of courses out there, but there's also a lot of people doing these courses now. And I found certainly with my degree, there was a lot of people who just assumed they would get a job in games because they did the degree and they didn't do anything else. And by the end of it, there's only a handful of us that actually graduated who went on to work for game studios. And a lot of people ended up in nothing to do with programming at all and completely different jobs. And I don't know how happy they were about that, but uh, you get what you put in. Yeah. Um, so work your ass off if it's your dream and you want to achieve it work really hard at your university course but also look for opportunities I did internships during my summer breaks and I took part in gaming competitions and I did volunteering uh, at the library doing like IT tutoring and stuff and all of these things build up a skills base that make you a more rounded individual and and just make your opportunities well, you have more opportunities then because you have more skills, you have more to offer. So for sure, do as much as you can and make use of your time as best you can is really important as well. Um, but always focus on what it is that you're actually wanting to get out of it. Like if you know you have your dream job, go for that dream job, look for the skills that are needed for that job, learn what those are and make sure you get those skills and do it in every way that you can. Such good advice and a great segue into the next question. So here we've got a bit of a Frankenstein question um, smooshed together from parts uh, from questions from three different people. So we've got uh, Tarha, Tarja, I'm sorry again if I've butchered that for you. Um, Jiv and Courtney ask some combination of this question. Uh, many companies want you to have experience before they'll consider hiring you. So it's hard to break into the industry if all you have is a relevant degree. What would you recommend as the most important action for a graduate to get hired in their first games job? How do you get that initial position in a role that usually requires experience? So Ellie, you've definitely answered that, I'd say, from the engineering side. Chloe, wonder what you think. 
so it actually links a little bit from what Ellie said as well as when you're doing your degree you don't you shouldn't just focus on your degree when you give a portfolio to a company if all it is is uni work it's going to show that you're not actually willing to branch out and try different stuff or Mm -hmm. have a bit of initiative to go out and do game jams and stuff like that because you're that's quite like a one way a narrow mindset is that a narrow mindset could I say that um (laughs) Well, so, Alex said ass, which we might have to beep. I almost hope that me repeating it means that we get a fun, like, filter, like a boop. Uh, anyway, yes, yeah, so a narrow mindset, <laughs> I think, is perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, um, and also, if you don't find, like, an opportunity that's specifically in-game, you're mm-hmm. also, I feel like you should always put your hardest into those jobs as well, because you're learning a lot of skills that are going to be transferable, such as, like, communication and, like, even punctuality is a thing, you know? That kind of that kind of stuff. I'm trying to really really hard to explain it properly, but that was good. Like you, I think uh, I think there's ways to make almost any experience relevant somehow. So we hired about six months ago a producer onto Everwild who had never worked in games, loved them. He played them his whole life. His passion was games, but he worked at Rolls Royce for 15 years and he did a stellar job of going, look, here's all the stuff that I've learned here that's going to be applicable to the role that you have. And I think exactly what you just said, Chloe, even if the jobs that you've had is working at game or, you know, working in a mechanics shop, there's definitely stuff that you've learned there that can be transferable. And I think for me, at least as a hiring manager, seeing someone able to do that lateral thinking and going, wait, I do have some skills is really important. Yeah. And you never know who you're going to meet as well. Mm. It's all those connections. Because a lot of where I am now, I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't do my previous jobs, because then they look back and they're like, oh, she's a she's an individual that is willing to try a lot of different stuff. Mm-hmm. I also liked that because I started as a junior, you know, like it was a role that was advertised as junior rigger. And sometimes they put like you need a little bit of experience, but I would say that you should definitely apply for it. it like. The company, if they if they are saying junior, they are not expecting you to be a master professional. Like they they yeah. know what they are looking for. They are looking for someone that is not not in young in age, but is starting a career and is willing to learn. And once maybe they really want to teach someone how the way of the how they do things. So that's why they are looking for a junior, which is someone that doesn't come with other backgrounds and other things and ways that they learn in other companies so really like a uh a, a really go for it if they say like oh one year experience just just apply it says junior the company is not really looking for someone that is a master mm-hmm. always do that application as well right always i think this is something that has been documented that women particularly if, if they see a job spec and they don't tick every one of the bullet points they are more hesitant to apply Go put the application in, right? The worst that's going to happen is you don't hear back. And yeah. that that is the worst, right? The next worst thing is they get back and they tell you no. Or maybe they tell you, actually, uh, you've only hit half of these things that we're looking for, but you had a really good application, a really good cover letter. So we'd love to have you in. So always, always apply. Any other thoughts about how you get your foot in the door when you're totally new? I think um, Camilla touched on the, that kind of... Um, people seeking that willingness and that motivation. And I think uh, Chloe mentioned as well, um, participating in things that aren't just, that you kind of like have to do going down of the routes, like in game jams and that kind of thing. Because I think being able to show that passion and that motivation really makes you stand out. So even if you are you have a little less experience than someone else, if they can see, wow, they're really motivated to do this, they can see from all these like, let's say extracurricular things that they're doing, that they're really passionate about what they're doing, then I think that really kind of sets you ahead of, of mm-hmm. others who maybe ha- don't have been going down that route as well. Um, and I think that game jams are also like really great for that because they often set these like creative constraints on you and it takes you out of your comfort zone. So that oftentimes will kind of broaden your portfolio in a way that maybe you hadn't thought to broaden it before. So you have all these different kind of things to show to different potential uh, teams and employers oh, yeah, I think that can be that can be quite powerful mm-hmm. can I add one more thing as well of course 
Um, so yeah, so I want to say also, if you don't get in the first time, don't be disheartened and not try again. Because I, I did apply for Rare during my third year at uni and I didn't get in. But I, I applied again because I had nothing to lose at that point after I graduated. And then that was when I got the job because they saw how I developed from that year in between. And they saw that there was a potential she was able to develop during that year. So mm-hmm. if you don't get it first time around, just try again. There's no harm. And if it just means you weren't ready the first time around as well. You know what else is so great to see? There's so much power in a strong cover letter. Like you have a totally blank page to tell this company why you want to work there, why you care about the games that they're making in particular. And it's really time consuming. And I know when you're looking for a job, when you're doing the 15th one, it can be quite disheartening. I think everyone has been there, right? But as again, as a hiring manager, when you read something that someone has clearly put time into and they've done their research on the company, they know what kind of games you make and it, you can tell when they actually care and they're like, oh, I actually love um, Banjo and Kazooie. Somebody's going to kill me for saying that one specifically. I don't know. Insert any rare game. But you can tell, right? They talk about how they played it as a kid and they're so excited now to use their degree and come in and apply. And I'm sure that's the same for every studio, right? You can just tell when someone actually wants to work where where they're yeah. applying to. So take the time to write that personal cover letter because if nothing else, we're going to see that that you actually just want to work here. Like, we know that if you're new, you're you're looking for your first job and you're probably writing versions of that letter for lots of people. But at the end of the day, it just shows us that you have taken that time and you know who we are and what we do and what you think you'd be doing if you got the job. <laughs> Another good segue here. It's almost like we've written these questions beforehand in order. <laughs> uh, what does a good CV look like, Ellie? Um, so... For me, I think a CV should be very organized, very clear and well structured, but to the point. Mm -hmm. So don't ramble. They don't need your whole life story on a CV. It just needs to present what you can bring to the job. But it should also be targeted for the job that you're applying for. So read the job spec like read all the skills that they're looking for read exactly what it is you're applying for know about the company before you go and look at your cv and then tailor it to that um i also think like it's important not to just have like some bullet points with a list of of sort of (laughs) superfluous skills with no context um so so going oh i'm really good at team working and I'm very good at communication and I'll, yeah, it, that doesn't tell you anything about a person. So give context to the things that you write on your on your CV. So say, well, I learned how to work well in a team through doing this project at university where we worked in a group and we did that. So give it a, give it a bit more depth there. Um, check your spelling. It's so important. Make sure you write your cover letter to the right person. I don't look at CVs, but I get enough emails from recruiters going, hey, how are things going at Ubisoft? That I'm just like, oh, (laughs) that's immediately going to get you kicked out. If you've just copy and pasted something from somewhere else, then it's not that I have anything against Ubisoft, but I don't work there. So don't send me a letter asking how it's going. You know. Uh, does anybody have any specific CV bugbears? Because I could talk about this all day. I want to hear what you dislike or really like about a CV. This question came from Sorin, by the way. Shireen, maybe it's an Irish name. We should really start asking for the pronunciations when they tell us their question. Apologies, Sorin, Shireen. It's probably neither of those. Um, anyway, tell me what you love or really don't love about a CV. Oh, we talked about this, didn't we? With the bars and the graphs. Yeah. Yeah. We've had we've had some of those through. Um and yeah, it's just I you think You mean the Rebecca, you mean the little graphs where people go, um, Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm five out of five good at Photoshop or I'm, you know, not I know ninety percent at Maya. <laughs> yeah. Thirty percent of of what? Um <laughs> That's so dangerous, it? those graphs, aren't they? Sorry. Like what are you saying if you tell me it's there's no good answer there's no good answer to a five out of five stars or a half full bar chart or a percentage out of a hundred if you tell me 50 
I'm going to wonder why are you not better at Photoshop if you're applying to me as an artist? Like you should know that if you tell me a hundred, I'm going to go. So you don't have anything left to learn. If you tell me 5%, why is it on your CV? Just, yeah, that's, that's one of those where there's no good answer. Just don't do it. I think it's that, um, it's that need and we all have it. Everyone has it. It's that nervousness to fill space. Mm. And so as we've mentioned, keep it succinct. Um, don't waffle, but also don't add weird visuals, if weird and necessary ways to show data that no one asked for. Like, d just don't do it. Um, there was a spate of it like a few years ago because it, it became popular to do it. Um, and like, everyone's just like, I'll try a little bit of, I'll, I'll sprinkle a little bit of graphic design onto it. And it's, just no, just don't. <laughs> keep it keep it professional keep it memorable though like add I want to know about you and I want to know about like what makes you special and I appreciate that you know we're going to work together um whoever this we person is whoever you are um <laughs> that we're going to you know work together and I want to know if you're good at your job or not um that would be nice but I'm also going to hire well if I ever get a chance to I'm also going to hire you if you're into the same Netflix show as me, or you really like to, you really love Mexican food, or you um, you went to Yellowstone National Park, and it's something that, you know, I can ask you about, and we can talk about, and it makes you a person rather than just a list of things that you're good at and things that you learned and degrees that you got. Absolutely. We've talked, we've talked about this in our previous chats, haven't we? But so, and there's some disagreement about this. Uh, a disagreement's a strong word, but I think people look for different things in CVs, right? So you have to take everything that we're saying here with a grain of salt. If if a graph on a CV for you is just going to get the information across that you need to get across, then you should do that, right? For me, my favorite thing when I get a CV is I go right to the personal stuff because often when you get CVs, especially for new, uh, like uh, more junior positions, the they've all got the university degrees. They've all got some, some bit of experience. A lot of them have done the game jams. They all are telling me they can work in teamwork. So all of that is going to sort of blend together. So I skip straight to the about me personal info section, and I want to hear the weird stuff that you love, right? I want to know that you are a competitive juggler or that you just really love like tap dancing or that, your whole thing in life is that you want to eat a burrito in every country that you visit, right? Because then when I go back and I've got my short list, I'm going to remember that you are the burrito person or the tap dancer. And it gives us something to have a conversation about when we start the interview process. So yeah, tell me what's weird about you. Cause that's what I'm going to remember. <laughs> People have pets as well. I, I would always say that like, if you just put a little line about like, I have a tarantula called John. And it's like, that's the tarantula person. They called it John. I have so many questions. And you remember that. You yeah. Use your pets. If you've got one, use it. Definitely. What else do we love to see on a CV? I like just, I mean, this may be, this may be something that's included in the cover letter as well, or, or like an email or even like an online form, but linking to something of your work that I can see, like your portfolio or um, something you've written or... Um, even for games design, something that I can play or a video or something yeah. that like just so there's something more, I can get a better idea of what it is that you're talking to me about in these like hopefully not contextless bullet points. Like So yeah, I think being able to like take me to a portfolio or something where I can visualize this or even play it would be great. So yeah. important, yeah. Uh, what's your like number one no-no on a CV? If there isn't a show reel on it, <laughs> yeah. Because especially with audio, if you don't have the show reel, almost comes above the CV. So it's almost like they'll look at the show reel before they even look at your CV. Because sometimes people don't have a degree and but they're still creating amazing content. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they don't judge it just via the CV. So if there's no show reel, they won't even take a second look at anything else. Yeah. Is it the same for you, Camilla? Yeah, yeah, for me, so like, 
I honestly did my CV just for like an obligation, it felt like, because it is all about your real and the time you spend like working in your real mm-hmm. and everything. And even in your real, you put like your email, you put like your website if you have it, because chances are that people like probably just HR will have a look at your like CV, probably the real like riggers and people that are checking my my application will just see the real anyway. Mm-hmm. Another thing I would like to add is that because uh, I'm uh, like for the international students, uh, I'm from Brazil, and then my university used to do uh, you could do like a consultation about your CV, and then there are so many difference like uh, differences in the UK CV and then mm-hmm. a Brazilian CV, for example. So just make sure you whatever you are applying to. Just make sure to have a look and see what are the normal rules about a CV. So just an example, in Brazil, you would put like, uh, if you're a female or male, you would put your age, you would put sometimes if you're married or single, uh, mm-hmm. all these like very personal informations, which in the UK are not like, you should never mention that because they don't really like, it doesn't matter your sex, it doesn't matter if you're married or not. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, just make sure whatever you're applying to, just check online like a, as an overall CV rule in that country. How how does that work? Yeah, really good advice. Again, right? Who are you applying to? What do they expect to see from you? Yeah. Um, Ellie, I'm wondering if there's something specific you really don't want to see on an engineer's CV. I'm not sure about what I wouldn't want to see, except, as I said, bad spelling and grammar. I mean, I find that instantly irksome. It just yeah. Does. <laughs> so, oh well, you you mistyped everything, and um, yeah, that that just bothers me. And I don't think it's all that difficult. There's a lot of tools out there to help you if you're not naturally great at spelling. And just get someone to look it over and make sure that's that's good. I would say for programming, though, CV is definitely like for your first step in the door. That's the most important thing because we don't really have showreels in programming so much i mean you can do but it's it's not in the same way it is with other disciplines and so the cv and listing what skills and qualifications you have really comes first and foremost and then being able to pass a programming test and talk about technical things is is the next sort of thing you would need but um yeah just just make it as i said not rambling not not anything that's that's gonna they're going to have to spend ages hunting through a list of like 50 skills. You know, if you know the company you're applying for makes their games using Unreal Engine, then highlight your skill with Unreal Engine. Don't talk about Unity for ages. Well, unless you don't have Unreal Engine skills, but you know, put the ones that are most important at the top front and center so that they can see it. Because if they look front and center and you're not listing any of the things they actually want and they have to read five pages in to find those things, that's not going to help you. Brevity, five pages. Listen, if you're new, you shouldn't have a five page CV. I've been doing this for almost a decade and mine is still only one page. So there's definitely something to be said for weeding some stuff out, getting to the point really quickly, only listing the most important things and really getting that small and compact and to the point for sure. I'd say that's, that's my big I think I've already gone, haven't I? I have a few annoyances with CVs, but when you're looking through hundreds of them, you're like, just tell me, tell me about the burritos and like get to the point. What can you do with Unreal? Okay, I digress. We will move on to Belinda's question. Belinda asks, is concept art ever likely to be a full-time job? And what do you need in your portfolio to stand out? Camilla. Well, it is already a full-time job. (laughs) Good news, Belinda. Yeah, (laughs) Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people applying for it. Uh, Well, the thing I would say, as as we all mentioned here, is is your real and having, like, your work to to show. But also for concept artists, and and these these you can use in other disciplines as well, but especially concept, is, like, think about the whole story of the thing you're creating and what the people are going to take. For example, you're drawing a character and then think about the person that is going to model that character and like if that can be 
replicate it, for example, in a 3D world, if that's what you want. And that would be amazing if you had in your portfolio someone that modeled a character and then you show, oh, this is my concept and this is someone that modeled this character. And more amazing if there is someone that rig it and there is someone that animated that. So show that your work is able to go across all the process of creating a game or an animation. And the same works for everyone, like a rigger, for example. If I just show a character just moving all the controllers around, it's just like, yeah, cool. But if I show an animation done with that character, then people are like, oh, this character really works. It feels alive and everything. So just, just think about the other disciplines as well, not just your own job. Anyone else got anything to add about uh, stand, making your portfolio stand out? I, I would say with concept art, um, for for a concept artist, you're both setting like the art direction for the game with your pieces. Um, but it's also about establishing the mood and the feeling of the game as well. Mm -hmm. So it's important to kind of be able to demonstrate like technical skills. So as Camilla said, being able to draw a character that will work in 3D and create an environment that could be made into a game level um, and being able to get all your perspectives and your color palettes and your proportions on the screen and all of that correct. Mm -hmm. um, but also being able to develop an art style and an emotion in your work, I think is really important for concepts specifically. And also just being able to show your working process a bit, like don't just show the most polished piece you can come up with, show something that is in development to show like how you got there and what your thinking yeah. was behind that and how that ties in and how you would do the job in its entirety and not just the final product. I'm sure that applies to lots of disciplines, right? It's like your math homework, your math's homework. They wanna see how you arrived at the thing that you got to. Cause if the end result is stunning, but all the steps in between are just completely insane and would never work in any professional setting that's going to be you know cause for a conversation at least uh so i'd say i i don't know how you actually show your work say in audio um chloe how would you how would you do that i'd say definitely for say sound design and stuff because there's loads of different layers for everything so it's always interesting to see what you could think out of the box so say you could use a chicken squawk for a dinosaur sound kind of kind of mm -hmm. thing you don't necessarily necessarily have to be caught up with oh what sounds the most natural kind of thing it's what you can create out of your own imagination and within the constraints of a game as well because obviously a game you've got like only a certain bit of memory you can't go too wild sometimes and with music you've got to be able to work create something that's loopable because you never know when you're going to move on to the next scene so it's not as if you're creating something for film where it's very linear everything happens at a certain timestamp kind of thing so if you're going to create something for game make sure it is something for game and not for any any other piece of media that mm. is because game is very specific that's I don't great. know if that answered the question actually no, yeah yeah that's great advice <laughs> I mean, I, I think like, I I'm not I an like audio expert. The point, and I felt like I just went, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's all useful, right? I'm sure that's context for someone that they didn't have before. There's there's some sound engineer out there right now going, oh, yeah, chicken squawk. Excellent. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. <laughs> I think that's um, not even done, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Jurassic Park, it was a combination of lions roaring and tortoises having sex. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Whoa, that's really random information, and I love that you know that, Ellie. That's, that's the sort of thing I want to see in a cover letter. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, I should mention at this point that we will be doing future conversations with sessions on specific disciplines. So we are intending to have one full audio session, one full writing session, design, et cetera, et cetera, um, as we work our way through the discipline. So uh, if you have any really specific questions that you want, we are intending to get groups of people from across the When of Xbox UK group to answer them for you. So more on that in the future. Okay, we've got our last question from Lucia, Lucia. What skills would make an applicant stand out most? Rebecca. In terms of for games, 
um, I think I you know mentioned it already before. Like you, you've just got to work, be able to work in a team. Mm. Um, I think that very much the um, that old age of games where you could be an absolute genius, um, but you need your own office and you you work alone and you expect everyone to you know like work around you, but it doesn't matter because you're so good at your job that it doesn't matter. That's not the case anymore. Mm. And games companies especially the ones that we're working at are these huge machines and everything has to move together in order to make these huge projects you know that we're all working on come out the other end um you could you can't be like a lone wolf um you've you know you've got to comment your code you've got to update your time tracking you've got to you know communicate with everyone around you as often as you can and be personable you know like I'm not talking about you can't be shy and you can't be an introvert to work in games you know lord only knows I've rather enjoyed a little bit of lockdown because it means that I don't have to deal with so many people every day it's nice um but it means I can still talk to people I can still talk to the people that I work with um be good and kind um, and be able to take criticism. Don't be attached to the work that you're doing because yeah. these things that we make, these magical, massive things that we create are a product of repeat iteration where things are just thrown at a wall, chucked in a bin, set on fire, um, <laughs> often before your very eyes. <laughs> Um, and you do get used to it as yeah. part of the process. And if anything, like the best advice that I was ever given is never go with your first idea. Mm. Because in that moment, that first idea is this beautiful pearl of a thing that you just like hold so close to your heart. But, you, oh, you've got to take a chisel to that pearl and crack it open and see what's inside um, and just keep going. Um, and that is where some of, you know, the courses that we've we've taken and the jobs that we've had, um, are able to give you that I don't want to call it a thick skin it's not um, you should never be in a position where you need a thick skin in order to do your job but you've got to get used to the fact it's not a slight against you if someone says this doesn't work it just doesn't work and you've got to go back to the drawing board and be able to do that every day I love that as you were talking about iterating and just be prepared for your work to be completely <laughs> destroyed. Everyone in, in the chat was nodding their heads like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we have a tear running pain. down. <laughs> this, was, this was one of the questions that HR uh, uh, asked me actually in their interview. They were like, would you feel upset if something that you've been working on for like a whole year for the game just completely like deleted and not appear in the game? It was like, well, yeah, <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> Little breaking heart and, emoji. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's true. Like, yeah. you put your heart on it, but sometimes you know that it's a bigger project and you, you, you learn probably so much and then next time you have to do something similar, you will be much faster and totally. yeah, part of part of the process. Yeah, I think for me, uh, and I, I'm not really sure how you communicate this, uh, in an application alone, but I think you can kind of tease it out in an interview. But for me, a, a key skill for an applicant is that adaptability. It is that, especially in production, right? Because our whole job really is change management. We make plans and usually within a couple of days, if not hours, sometimes only one further meeting, the plan is it's changed, right? So you just, it's such good advice to stop being precious about stuff because it's going to it's going to change right we have to put the needs of the project first that all i mean obviously we're also putting uh putting our staff members needs first as well but in a different sort of way if if i need to ask camilla all of your work for the last year because that's what's best for the project then i would deliver that news to you calmly and maybe i'd have some candy if we were in the office together because i know that would be hard for you <laughs> but at the end of the day we have to do what's best for the project um alice what key skills do you think make an applicant stand out for design? Well, for design, I, I think, I think kind of just in general, but actually, yeah, especially for design, um, being a good communicator is so important. And I think that 
being able to show uh, communication skills is something that you can do on your application without having to have worked in games before. It's one of those things that's just so transferable from basically any other job unless you're working like in a lighthouse by yourself somewhere. Yeah. And even that's some kind of like communication, right? It's just like <laughs> so, <laughs> the light. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so I think that that's something that you can quite easily um, show on your application from whether it doesn't even have to be another job it could be from university mm. it could be from like some after school activity or um like student organization or even volunteering it's just something that you can you should make take the time to show on an application um i think active listening as well is really important showing that you are like you said responsive to feedback and criticism and you are responsive to other people's opinions and you're actually listening to what's being said and not just kind of hearing it and then it's like just goes away completely forever um and that again is something that's really transferable i think from, from other um jobs and such me with my amazing communication skills <laughs> um, uh, yeah <laughs> I think giving feedback in a constructive way is another skill that I would love to see. I feel like that one's harder to ask of someone who is new. Uh, I think that's something that as an industry, we have to be okay with taking on and teaching people because it's it's really hard to give that bad news to Camilla. That work is just, it's got to go. I'm sorry. Like giving that in a way that is concrete, but also, um, you know, the soft skills come back into play. It's like you have to give that in a way that that your team members are going to feel okay to keep working and the morale isn't going to take too much of a hit and uh it's it's hard to do that but I would love to see that from someone new if they felt like they could give feedback really well that would be amazing any other key skills Ellie what you got um again much more of a soft skill but I think just being able to demonstrate enthusiasm and passion for what it is you do and for the company and the role that you're applying for yeah because there's nothing worse than working with someone who's just like oh this job sucks everybody's rubbish here and I don't like this company and it's like that's just gonna drag everyone down nobody wants to work with that person so I love that voice I feel like there's someone (laughs) specific in mind here that we're never gonna know about but they're there But yeah, just just enthusiasm and passion because those are the things that make people want to work with you. Like if you're positive about what you do and you bring that energy to it, then that will attract people and make them want to work with you. You know what else gets me? Um, So at Rare, we do uh, an internship program and we do it across all disciplines. It's been harder this year with coronavirus. Um, But last year we had... I don't know, 2000 applicants for the programming internship. It was mad. So you, you know, all take all of this information and use that because you need to find something to make yourself stand out because the standard starts to get so high that rare. Basically we hire almost all of our interns. Now they finish, we give them a job because the standard is so high, but something that really gets me when I'm going through the production ones is They'll apply with their name. Uh, So we're going to use Alice. So we've got Alice Winter and she's applying (laughs) for a production internship. And she's got this great cover letter that tells me why she loves production. And then her email will be like alicewinterdesign at gmail.com. And I'm like, oh, something's happening here. And you dig a little deeper and maybe you go to the, the link that they've sent. And their website is all about game design. So I get that when you're new, you're trying to find your feet and you might not be sure what you want to do, but don't apply for things that you don't actually want to do just to get your foot in the door because that will become obvious really quickly. And then you will be that person that Ellie has so aptly describes because if you're not doing what you like, it's it's going to be hard and a lot more painful. So I'd say at least in this application and the information that you are going to send me to review, make sure that you've sent me, you know, production related things or engineering related things. I, I want to see why you would love to be a producer specifically. And we sort of talked about this in our, our pre-chat and I think we should bring it up as well. Um, I think a key piece of advice used to be to get into the industry to start in QA. 
and you can get your foot in the door. You just test, test for a little bit and then you can move on and do something else that's better. And we felt as a group that it was really important to call out that that's not the case anymore. Quality assurance is an important, vital, necessary Absolutely. It's a career path. It's a discipline. You can get really good at it and you can do that for your career. And we don't want it to be viewed anymore as just a foot in the door. Anybody got anything they want to add to that? I realized that was quite, there was hands and stuff involved, but. (laughs) I was just going to agree with you. Like, um, and it was going off what Ellie said as well, that nothing maybe it was in the the uh, the old days I don't want to upset anyone by saying the old days um (laughs) the good old days you know like a while back um yeah there weren't as many um specific roles like not saying that people were generalists but there was a little bit more of mucking in and that's not how it works anymore like you are aiming for being a lighting artist you're Mm -hmm. aiming for being like a a prop modeler you're aiming for being like these very specific like gameplay designers that sort of thing and there is such and it's still it's still so pervasive that Mm -hmm. belief that you can use certain roles QA being one of them which drives me up the wall that are this kind of like a stepping stone to get to where you want to be or you can use these specific roles to get to the next rung of the ladder and that's not that's not and people can you know as you were just saying see through that so easily mm-hmm. now and people still will go say you know oh, i just really want to get into qa so i can go on to do such and such and they admit that and they can put that on their cv sometimes you know why why are you admitting this you are just literally broadcasting to everyone that you don't respect the roles and every role is needed to make a game and get it shipped out the other side, right? Otherwise, Absolutely. this big machine would not work. And importantly as well, it's it's this is the conversation that we're having now is is at the level of Xbox Studios, right? So I think it, the advice stands if you're going into indie, but it is slightly different because there's much more like everybody just pitches in to get the thing shipped, right? If there's eight people in a team, you're you're kind of taking up lots of different roles, but Here at our Xbox studios, uh, QA is an entire division that we couldn't do without. And um, you need a certain skill set to do that. And and not everyone is going to be good at that. So I'd say uh, it is absolutely a job. We need more of them. So if that's what you're into, get out there. Any other other thoughts on QA or key skills to make an applicant? Camilla, what would you want to see? Well... People always told me that is like, especially in rigging, is this pro problem solving things. Mm. So like rigging is basically fixing things that animators broke. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> no animators in the group, so I'm safe. <laughs> uh, no, but it's true. It's, a, it's just that willing of like learn. Um, and just just wanting to learn more and then I, I've got these type of feedbacks from my work that mm-hmm. is like ah, oh, you're always like keen to learn a different technique learn something new um, and I think it's important from from any job basically if you go to the interview showing that look I don't maybe you're a junior I don't have all these skills but I really like this thing I would like how you did that and like just showing the interest of like learning uh, I think it's very important Mm-hmm. As Chloe said earlier, that's that's how she got the job, right? It was it was that second application and that showing your growth mm-hmm. there. So it can happen to anyone. Okay, we've reached the end of our submitted questions, but I have a surprise bonus question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Getting some action in there on an on an afternoon. Okay, so the surprise bonus question I have is: uh, we can leave our kindly viewers with one piece of advice. So what's the one piece of advice that you would give to someone wanting to break into games? And we're going to start with Alice. I think it's just important for basically just everybody to know that you shouldn't lose motivation if you are um, passionate about something and you're applying for things and or you're on a uni course or you're even in a role and 
you find yourself being the only person like you or the only person who looks like you in, in the room at times um, or ever in some cases. Um, I think you just have to stay focused on your passion and don't lose motivation just because you are the only voice like yours in that environment because, you know, hopefully that's something that we can all work to change and you just have to know that you are still super valuable. You're, you're hugely valuable, even if you're um, different. And, you know, having like a diverse group of people is infinitely more valuable than having a group of people that are just all, all very similar. So, yeah, I would just say don't lose faith in yourself and your passion and stay motivated. I love that. <laughs> Ellie, what's your one piece of advice? Um, so for me, I kind of have a, a life philosophy that I, I think it works for me anyway, where I have a picture in my head. I like to like visualize in my head who I want it to be, like what kind of person I want to be, like what job I want, what I want to be doing, how I want to be behaving. And then when I'm doing stuff, I just go, am I being that person? And if I'm not, then I need to change. And so it's, it's kind of just like be the person you want to be. So, but more of a more of a visualization exercise, I think, in that. But chase your dreams, fight for what you want, like have a, have a clear image of what kind of life you want to lead and go after it with everything you've got because, well, this is your chance. Go for it. Such power, Ellie. You've got me all jacked up. I'm already in a job that I love, but I'm like, who do I want to be? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Camilla, do you want to follow that one up? I'm ready. I'm pumped now. Let's go. Oh, it's, it's been hard to be this year. <laughs> so the thing I would say is that uh, I think like all these situations where you're all living, pandemic, working from home, and then mm. people might feel like, oh, this is so hard, I'll never get this job. Like, honestly, just apply, 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 like as many times as you can for many companies as you identify with. Don't just stick with one thing and one company and it's like, mm. oh my God, if I don't get this job, that's my career ruined. Like, open a little bit and, and really apply and like send it CVs, connect with people on LinkedIn, like message people, like send message to people. Don't don't just add as a friend, send a private message. Oh, I'd like to connect to you because of this, this and this. Just don't start adding everyone. Like, so don't do but yeah, just try to reach people. And for example, when I applied for Ninja, I wasn't in the country. I did all my process online on like using cameras for the interviews. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to the office was on my first day of work. So like, don't put this pandemic thing as your biggest like step and uh, your biggest like rock in your way. Mm -hmm. uh, there are ways to go around it and just keep applying. Mm -hmm. And now is probably a good time to mention that every one of our companies is actively recruiting. We're hiring in many disciplines. We're all working on super exciting projects. So indeed, like um, if anything, can there be a silver lining to a pandemic? I don't know. But I think uh, we're all doing really well, like as far as our companies go, right? We're all still working on our projects. We're doing it from home. We've, we're hiring people now from all over the shop. They don't have to be living where the studio is. So it's actually a, a really exciting time to be joining our studios. Uh, Chloe, what advice do you have to someone trying to break in? Uh, I'd say just kind of be yourself because aside from just, all like all your skills and stuff there is a culture to every studio mm -hmm. and sometimes what they don't hire you is because you put, might not be a fit personality wise into the culture and that's a good thing for both the company and for you because you might not be happy there as well so mm -hmm. just be yourself because you never know like it might be a blessing in disguise that you didn't get recruited into that job and vice versa so that's Mine. Not really good advice. Good reminder to everyone that you are interviewing the company as much as they are interviewing mm. you. So go ask questions, find out what that studio culture is like and whether that's something that you want to give your blood, sweat and tears to, right? Because our jobs are sometimes really hard and challenging. So you you definitely want to be in a culture and in a studio that, um, that you're vibing with, that you feel like is going to look after you. 
Uh, and last but not least, Rebecca, I'd love to hear your piece of advice. Yeah, so my advice um, for not not just breaking into the games industry, but in general, is um, to be kind. Um, and ending on a very soft note, uh, just the people around you aren't your competition. Um, they're your greatest cheerleaders. Oh, that's a slogan and a half, well isn't it? <laughs> oh. Everything is like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're going to be the ones that lift you up. They're going to be the ones that message you on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on whatever. Have you seen this job? I think it's perfect for you. They're your mutuals. They're the people that you're probably going to eventually work with. The UK games industry is really small. It's really intimate. And people don't want to work with people that make their days difficult. They want to work with people that they want to go for a drink or play mini golf or you know, share cake with in the studio or buy a coffee. Um, and at the end of the day, universities. Oh, there he is. There That's he is. Why. Did you hear him? <laughs> For God's sake. At oh. the end of the day, universities especially, um, it's not on them. It's not necessarily something that they foster. Mm. Some do. Um, that's a problem across the board, is this environment of competition that there is almost like a clock above your head, that time is running out, that there's only a handful of jobs going in the industry, especially at a junior position, and that you all have to fight each other like it's the Hunger Games for it, tooth and nail. And I remember feeling that when I was at university, it was horrible because you just look around at all these people that you had so many beautiful memories with and come the end of it, you were almost like waiting for the klaxon to go off so you could race them to the finish line. And it shouldn't be like that um, because at the end of the day, the people that you work with and the people that you meet are lovely. Yay. Yeah, that's that's really awesome advice. I, I, um, I, I didn't go through university for my, um, you know, I told you how I got in, little, little admin side door. Um, so I never felt that competition, but I, it makes me quite sad that um, people going through university or perhaps new in their careers feel that because I, as you say, Rebecca, have I've had the exact opposite experience. I've made some of my best friends at studios. I felt nothing but supported, especially by the women that I've worked with. Uh, and in fact, Louise, my boss now, I, I had already accepted another job and it took me about 30 seconds of my interview with Louise to know that she was the boss for me. And, and like she as a human sold it for me. You know, I, I thought I want to come work with you because you're going to do awesome things. So I've only ever felt like wonderfully supported and, and held up by the other women in the industry. And I'm glad to hear that you feel that way as well. Xbox. <laughs> Okay, anybody got anything else they want to add? Well, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. I will apologize one last time for probably butchering many of your names, uh, but that's okay. We'll sort that next time. Uh, thank you to the lovely panelists for your time and your wisdom today. There's been some great stuff in here. Thank you to everyone watching this now. Uh, we, as I said before, are planning to do a lot more of these conversations with. We have many, many things on the list already, but we want to hear what you want to see. So if there's something specific that you want to see the women of Xbox discuss, uh, if there's one of the disciplines that you'd love us to start with and you've got a good case for it, then send it along. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions, your topic suggestions, and any thoughts or feelings that you had about this very first conversations with. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you.